Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today we're going to learn about the second partial derivatives of a function of two variables. So we've already learned about the first partial derivatives of a multivariable function. What they are is you hold all of the variables except for one constant, and then take the derivative with respect to that other variable. Well, the second partial derivatives, it's just what you get if you take the derivative with respect to some variable, and then take the derivative with respect to some variable again. Maybe you take the derivative with respect to the same variable, or maybe you take the derivative with respect to some other variable, okay? It's okay to mix and match as well. And the reason that we're gonna look at these is it turns out that these second partial derivatives, they're, they're useful for classifying critical points as either maximums, minimums, or saddles. Remember from the previous lecture, those were the three types of, tr of critical points that we learned exist for functions of two or more variables. Okay, so let's get to it. These second partial derivatives, they generalize the second derivative of a single variable function very naturally. Okay, so remember if you have a function of just one variable, the second derivative, we denoted it by f prime prime or f double prime, and what that meant was you took the function and then you took its derivative and then you took the derivative of that. Okay, so you just took the derivative twice and you get the second derivative. Okay, well the idea can be the same for multivariable functions. You start off with a function of two variables and then to start when you take the derivative the first time, you have two choices for how you take the derivative. Okay, so let's imagine we take the derivative with respect to x. Okay, we construct the x partial derivative. Okay, well after we do that, again, we have two choices for how we proceed from there. From the x partial derivative, we could again take the x partial derivative, so we take the x partial of the x partial, okay? And when we do that, we get something that we call the double x partial or the, the second derivative with respect to x. And we denote it like this, okay? So this, this del squared here, that means take the derivative twice. And then the x squared over here, that means, you know, with respect to x twice. Okay, but we didn't have to take the derivative that way. We could have instead taken the derivative with respect to x the first time, just like we did before. But then after we take the derivative with respect to x, next we take the derivative with respect to y instead. Okay, and this gives us something called a mixed partial derivative. Okay, so the notation, again, it's del squared of f. Okay, and again, that means you're taking the partial derivative twice, but this time it's del y del x on the bottom. And what that means, this is read from right to left. That means you first took the partial derivative with respect to x and then took it with respect to y. Okay, and those aren't the only possibilities though. Those are the two possibilities if at first we took the partial derivative with respect to x, but we could have also started off with the y derivative and then took the x derivative. And if we did that, again, we would get something called a mixed partial derivative, okay? But this time it's del squared of f over del x del y. That means we took the y first and then the x. Again, remember it's right to left. So del y del x, y first then x, okay? Or we could take the derivative with respect to y both times, right? So the notation is this this time, okay? So still del squared on top because you're taking two partial derivatives, but this time it's del y squared on the bottom because both of them are with respect to y. Okay, so overall, well, you get two partial derivatives and then you get four second partial derivatives, right? Because you have two choices at every step. And you can imagine we could go on even farther than this. We could take third partial derivatives if we wanted to, and that time we would get eight third partial derivatives, because from each of these four second partials, you have two choices. So you get eight in total when you go to third partials, and then you get 16 and 32 and so on. Every time you go sort of up a sort of layer of partial derivatives, you get double as many uh, possibilities. Okay, so let's go through an example here. Let's find the second partial derivatives of this function, y times sine of x, okay? And I've already got up here sort of our starting point here. To, before you find the second partials, you've got to find the first partials, okay? So that's your starting point. First, find the derivative with respect to x. So keep y a constant and construct the derivative of sine x while that becomes a cos x and you still have the y out in front because with respect to x, that's a constant, okay? So there's our x partial. And now let's also construct our y partial, okay? So our y partial, this time sine of x is a constant because x is a constant. So the derivative, it's just, well, what's the derivative of y? Well, derivative of y is one times this constant sine of x, okay? So the partial with respect to y is just sine of x. Okay, so those are our two first partial derivatives. And now we're gonna construct the two different partial derivatives of each of these guys. And at the end of the day, we're gonna get four 
second partial derivative. So let's see, see how this works. Okay, let's start on the left. We already computed the first partial with respect to x. Now let's compute the x partial derivative of this one, and that'll get us the second x partial derivative of the original function. Okay, so if we do the x partial derivative of this one, well, again, y is a constant, so it's just going to get carried along for the ride. And then derivative of cos x, well, that's minus sine x. Okay, so altogether we get minus y times sine x. Okay, but we could have also computed the y partial derivative of this x partial. Okay, and if we do that, this time cos of x is going to be a constant, and the y will just turn into a 1 when we take its derivative. So we're just left with cos x after we take that y partial of the x partial. Okay, and again, remember this notation's read right to left. We did the x partial, and then we did the y partial. Okay. We have two more to go, okay? Now we're gonna work on this right-hand side. Starting with the y partial, we have two partials of that that we can take. So let's start off, let's take the x partial of the y partial, okay? So we're gonna take the x derivative of sine of x. Well, so derivative of sine of x is just cos of x, so we get this here. The, the derivative where we did the y derivative first and then the x derivative, eh, we get cos x at the end of the day, okay? And now if we go back and take the y derivative of this y derivative, Derivative of sine of x with respect to y, though, so be careful here. Ask yourself, well, where are the y's in this expression? Well, there are none. x is a constant, so sine of x is a constant, so its derivative is zero, right? Okay, so be careful there. Sort of what's happening here is with respect to y, this original function is linear. So with respect to y, its second derivative is zero, right? Its first derivative is a constant, second derivative is zero. Okay, so those are our four partial derivatives. Now, to get a bit of a feeling for what's going on here with these different four partial derivatives and what they represent geometrically, let, let's show the graph of this function. So again, I'm gonna rotate it around a little bit just so that you can hopefully get a bit of a feeling for what it looks like. Okay, so here's the graph of the function. I mean, it's just sort of a wavy sheet of paper. Okay, um, now let's focus on this first second partial derivative at first, okay? Um, this this partial second partial derivative with respect to x both times, okay? And now what this is telling us, what this second partial with respect to x is telling us is it's telling us what the concavity of the function looks like in the x direction, right? Remember for one variable functions, the second derivative told us about concavity. If it was positive, it was concave up. If it was negative, it was concave down, okay? Well here, it's the exact same thing, it's just in the x direction. So if we sort of forget about the y-axis and only focus on what's happening in the x direction, then at every point, this second derivative is telling us about the concavity of the function. Okay, so for example, if we plug in x equals pi over two and y equals one, well, it's just straightforward. You plug that into this formula here, you're gonna find that the second partial derivative with respect to x each time is just minus one. So that means at this point, pi over two, one, in the x direction, the function is concave down. And you can see that from the graph here. That's sort of what I've drawn. Here, here's that point, and in the x direction, it's concave down. It looks like an upside down parabola. All right, so that's the double x partial, what it represents, concavity in the x direction. Similarly, the double y partial tells us about concavity in the y direction, okay? And for this function, the second y partial was just equal to zero. So what's that tell us? It's not concave up, it's not concave down, it's actually linear in the y direction. So if you forget about the x direction, forget about this x-axis and just focus on sort of these y slices, well, the graph of this function in that direction is always just a straight line. And that we can see that on the graph here. These sort of y cross sections, they're just straight lines everywhere, okay? It's not concave up or concave down. Okay, the mixed partials, they're a little bit trickier to get our head around, okay? But let's try, okay? In particular, let's focus on this partial where we first took the derivative with respect to y and then took the derivative with respect to x. Now, what this is telling us, this is telling us about the x rate of change of the y rate of change, okay? It's telling us how quickly the y rate of change is changing as I change my x, okay? So in other words, imagine that you're somewhere on the graph of this function. Okay, so here, x marks the spot, and now you start walking in the x direction, in the positive x direction. What this second partial derivative is telling you, this mixed partial, it's telling you how the y slope is changing, okay? So, as I walk down here, what's happening to my y slope? 
Well, it's just the slope of these lines. And if you look at this graph, you can see that the Y slopes as I walk in the X direction are increasing and increasing and increasing, okay? Over here on the left end of the graph, the Y slopes are kind of negative. Then it gets flat and then actually here they start increasing. The Y slopes over on this side are positive. Okay, so that tells me that the mixed partial is positive. Okay, and yeah, cosine of X, I mean, in for these values of X, is positive, okay? So the mixed partial there, it tells you as I walk in the X direction, how quickly is my, like what's happening to my Y slope as I walk in that direction. Okay, and one other thing to notice about these derivatives here is these middle ones, those are the same, right? If I took the derivative with respect to X and then Y, I got cos of X. Or if I took the derivative with respect to Y and then X, I also got cos X. It turned out that those two things were the same. Those mixed partials were the same in this particular case. Okay, so yeah, in this example, we had the mixed partials being the same. That is not a coincidence. It's a fantastic fact that actually this is true for any functions with the property that these second partials, the mixed partials, as long as they're continuous, they have to be the same as each other, okay? So this is a result called Clairaut's theorem. So this is really nice, okay? It tells us in a sense that even though, yeah, there are four second partial derivatives, eh, there's kind of only three, right? You only actually have to compute three of them. You get the fourth for free as long as the mixed partial that you computed was actually continuous, okay? And I mean, for most real world functions that we actually use, in particular, I mean, any function that we see in this course, this will be true. Those second mixed partials will be continuous. Okay, and an, ana an analogous fact holds for higher order derivatives. If you go down to the third derivative, well, all of the mixed partials are the same as long as you take the derivative with respect to each variable the same number of times, but the order of the variables doesn't matter. So you can do an X and then an X and then a Y. That'll be the same as if you do an X, then a Y, then an X, or a Y, then an X, then an X, okay? As long as the number of each variable is the same in each, each mixed partial, yeah, they're gonna equal each other. Okay, so that will do it for a discussion of second partial derivatives. What we're gonna do next class is we're gonna use these second partial derivatives to classify critical points, and we're gonna classify them either as mins or maxes or, you know, as these saddle points that are neither mins nor maxes. Okay, so I'll see you then for that.